Good morning, Start with Community Church. Um, no, this is not Pastor Joe, as you can tell. Um, instead, you get uh, Brother Brown today. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and jump into it uh, this morning. Thankful to be here with you. Uh, thankful that we still get to worship during this time. And um, uh, it's an honor to be able to walk through uh, scriptures with you today. Uh, our passage today is going to be in uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 and um, if you if you have a Bible with you or uh, one in your house you want to go get it um, go do that now and go ahead and uh, be flipping there uh, but uh, Philippians so the book Philippians Paul is writing in this chapter to the Philippian church who that the church is struggling with unity um, and Paul basically tells them that um, one, that you need to have unity in the church, and two, uh, the way you have this unity is through humility. And so we're going to be talking about how to live a life of humility today, and uh, I think Paul gives us some, some practical uh, ways to do that uh, in this passage, and ultimately he, he points to Christ as our ultimate example of humility. Um, but before we, before we read the passage, um, I looked up just a uh, a simple definition, um, Googled it, of what a good definition of humility was, and um, it's a modest or low view of one's own importance. Um, I think that's a good definition. I think that encapsulates what uh, humility really is. Um, however, there's a problem with this. Um, we tend to be uh, sinful and therefore uh, very selfish people. Um, we struggle with this, uh, if we're honest. We struggle not to live selfishly. We struggle to live uh, in humility. I'm sure if we were all honest with ourselves, that's that's the reality for us. Um, there's a couple of quotes I have here. Um, this one's from by Ted Turner, uh, creator of, uh, or owner, I guess, of CNN, billionaire. Um, he owns all kinds of stuff, but he said this, uh, if I only had a little humility, I would be perfect. Uh, another quote, uh, if there's one thing I'm better at than anyone else, it's humility, uh, unknown. So a lot of times, uh, this is kind of the mindset we have. Uh, we tend to be just uh, selfish, prideful, and arrogant people, um, if I'm being honest. And that's, that's myself as well, if, if I'm honest with myself a lot of times. Um, but... Uh, I want to share with you a story I heard uh, or I read it once. Um, it was about D.L. Moody. He's a, a famous evangelist uh, that lived during the 1800s. And uh, by the late 1800s, he was very well known evangelist. Um, and he held a, a Bible conference um, oftentimes in Northfield, Massachusetts. Um, and so he was kind of the leader, the face of the conference, um, very popular evangelist. And so during this time, some people came to this conference who were a group of pastors from Europe uh, were among the people attending this conference. And so a custom in Europe is to, whenever you stay somewhere, uh, to when you go to bed at night, when you go in your room, and these, these group of European uh, men who were pastors they were staying in a, a dormitory and so it was custom you would go in your room and they would leave their shoes outside of their room and what they were doing was they expected a servant or someone to come and pick up their shoes and clean them um, overnight so obviously it's not the custom in america um, so these men had left their shoes outside in their room and obviously there was no one coming to clean them uh, in Massachusetts. So later that night, D.L. Moody, um, again, the very famous evangelist who was uh, kind of the feature of this conference, he was walking around the dorms praying for each, uh, each person individually that was there in attendance. And he realized quickly as he saw these shoes sitting outside, he realized what had happened. And he went and mentioned a few of the uh, he went and mentioned to a few of his students about uh, what had happened and um, was going to see if he could get some help to clean their shoes. Um, but none of them offered to help. So without another word, um, 
D.L. Moody gathers up, gathers up all the shoes uh, and he takes them back to his room to clean and polish every single pair of shoes that he had found. Um, and no one would have known about this, but in the, in the midst of that, while uh, Moody was cleaning the shoes in his room, one of his friends uh, came in and noticed what he was doing and helped him finish um, and later went on to tell, tell that story of what had happened. And so my point in that story is uh, despite all the praise and I guess fame that D.O. Moody had received uh, during his time in history for just because of God's blessing on his life and on his ministry, um, very famous, uh, very fruitful ministry, uh, D.O. Moody still remained a humble man and he understood uh, the source of his success and of his ministry um, and that source was Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, King of Heaven, and um, he had the right to to honor, praise, and worship. And as Paul is going to talk about in this passage, uh, he laid down Jesus. He had all that right in heaven, um, and he laid that all down, all of his privileges aside, and became a lowly servant, so that sinners like me and like you um, could have have hope for eternal life. Um, through his death on the cross and his sacrifice. And so um, we will never, um, you know, be like Jesus uh, if we fail to live a life of humility. And a lot of times we hear people talk about, you know, um, I, I just want to live like Jesus. Um, I want to live like Jesus lived. And, you know, while, while Jesus is a model for how we should live our lives, uh, many who, who speak like that are, myself oftentimes are unwilling to give up um, our rights and our pride and truly reflect the humility that Jesus lived with. Um, and, you know, I think uh, this message of humility is one that we need to hear today uh, in the church. And, and this is the only thing I'm going to say about the coronavirus, the pandemic that's going on. You know, I don't, I don't know the solution uh, moving forward. I don't know what's best. I know there's so many opinions and just uh, a lot of frustration and, and I get it. You know, it's, it's, we've been dealing with this for a long time now and there's not really a, I guess a right or wrong answer moving forward. Um, however, what I do want to say to you church is that I do know that there is a right way to respond to wherever we, we go from here with this pandemic. And that is to respond with humility. Um, like Jesus would have responded. So uh, that's my word to you on that. So let's go ahead and jump in the passage, um, and we'll go ahead and read that. Uh, Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. Uh, it's here on the screen if you need words. It says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, so, uh, as we jump into this passage, I want you to look back with me, uh, if you have your Bible, in... Um, Look back in chapter 1, verse 27, and Paul is going to give us some context here, kind of of why. Um, why is Paul urging so desperately for the church to be unified and to, to live in humility? Well, I think it shows us here in verse 27. I'm going to read that. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, Listen to this, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So, uh, looking, at, looking at that verse, we see um, 
kind of Paul's reasoning for writing uh, what he did in chapter 2, and that is Paul's asking for unity, not just for the sake of unity, not just so that um, we can all agree, um, but he's asking so that we can effectively uh, share the gospel, so that the gospel can go out. Uh, we can't do that if we're not unified. So I think Paul shows us two kind of overarching themes uh, in this message, uh, in this passage, and that is, uh, I think he shows us, one, the instruction for living a life of humility, and two, the illustration for living a life of humility. So we're going to head, go ahead and jump into that first one and look at uh, the instruction for living a life of humility. So looking at verses 3 through 4, um, Paul talks about first, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So thinking about that, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Um, that's hard. Selfish, amb selfish ambition is one of those sins that can easily sneak into uh, to our lives, into the motives for the things we do. Um, it, it can easily contaminate just about anything we do. Uh, an example of this, uh, if you'll turn to Luke uh, chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. Uh, read with me real quick. It says that for the Son of Man goes... Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong word. Verse 24, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you, rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at a table, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at a table, but I am among you as the one who serves? Um... So as I was saying, selfish ambition has a way of sneaking in even some of the most holiest moments um, in our lives. Uh, you look at this account, even in Jesus' final meal, uh, last time he's going to be fellowshipping with his disciples before his death on the cross, a debate breaks out amongst the 12 disciples, and they start arguing about who's the greatest uh, among them. And so, you know, it's, it's so easy, and Paul's warning us against this type of selfishness. Um, it's so easy uh, in the things we do, even if we think we have good intentions, it's easy to let selfish ambitions uh, slip in there. And so our lives, um, I think what Paul's saying is our lives cannot be driven by selfish ambition if we want to have a life of humility. Um, so the next thing, uh, we have to count others as more significant than yourself. Uh, it's the next uh, portion of that verse. Uh, I have a quote here by Richard Whiteley says a man is called selfish not for pursuing his own good but for neglecting his neighbors um, this too is a tough one to exercise um, really uh, because of the uh, our society in America today uh, it's so narcissistic um, it's all about me I and America really is just plagued with this idea that uh, that I am what's most important, um, and it's all around us. Uh, it's 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 in the church as well. Uh, it's crept into the church, and you know it's this type of mentality that says that you know I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, I don't care how it affects you. I don't care how it affects him or her or anybody else. Um, I'm going to do what I want to do, and it's that type of mentality uh, that has really given way to quarrels and splits and just a lack of unity in America and, and in the church in America. And, you know, we've all been guilty of this, um, but Paul's warning here, Paul's warning the church at Philippi uh, that, you know, I cannot, I cannot be the most important person in my life if I'm going to follow Christ and if I'm going to live humbly. Uh, it just can't happen. Um, so the third thing I want us to see under uh, the instruction for living a life of humility is to look at verse, uh, verse 4 that says uh, we should look not only to our own interests but also to the interest of others. Um, and this, point, this second and third point, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but basically, uh, 
Verse 4 is really just another way of saying the words of Jesus, uh, to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and if you look at verse 4, uh, the word interest, uh, look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. That word interest uh, is actually a filler word. So basically what that means in the original language, uh, it's open-ended. So it's not specific. Um, all that is specified is your own something interest and the others something interest. So uh, it could read something like this. Uh, you know, let each of you look not only to your own family um, or let each of you look not only to your own health or education or success um, or happiness, you know, fill in the blank. Um, so what Paul is saying is don't just think about those things for yourself in your own life, um, but also think about that um, in the lives of others as well. Think about, look to, uh, look out for others' families, for others' health, uh, for their education, for their success, for their happiness. Look out uh, for the interest of others as well. Um, and so uh, I want to move on now to uh, what I believe Paul gives us is the illustration for living a life of humility uh, in verses five through eight. And it's clear here that Paul uh, points to, to Jesus as the only um, adequate example of true humility. Um, Jesus is, um, you know, Jesus is our model. Uh, we must remember that Jesus is obviously much more than just a model, but he's never less than that. And so we should, um, we should take um, how he lived his life and try to model ours after that. And he is the ultimate example of, of selflessness. Um, and note in verse 5 that Paul writes that this mind of humility, um, this having unity and humility uh, in our hearts, that is only ours in Christ Jesus. So apart from Christ, we, uh, we cannot live a life of humility. Um, you know, it's just not possible. Um, we'll, we'll be doing it. We'll be doing the things we do all for the wrong reasons, even if they, they seem humble. Um, and so you may say, well, yeah, well, I can do good things and, and still be kind to people, you know, even if I don't know Jesus or do good deeds. And that's true. You can, but, uh, it's likely that you'll just be doing them for your own glory and not for the glory of God. And, and that's not humility. Um, so, uh, a, a, um, a quote I like uh, from C.J. Mahaney says this, it says, Humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. And so really, if you think about it, humility is really just having a right view of ourselves, um, understanding who we are uh, in light of a holy God. And so um, first I want to, you know, Paul shows us that Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Um, and in no way do these verses indicate that Christ uh, lost or removed an ounce of his deity uh, or his identity as God when we think about the Trinity. Um, but instead, what that emptiness uh, really means is that God became a human. We see kind of opposites. You know, Scripture tells us that God is not like man and, and vice versa. So we see that God became a human, and we also see that Lord became a servant. Um, two opposites as well. You know, a Lord typically has servants, but in this case, our Lord became our servant. And so, um, you know, this, uh, Paul's language, uh, the scripture, it really expresses and shows us how willing Christ was to, to lay aside all of his glory and, and, um, in heaven with God, the father, and to take on the form of, uh, of a servant in human flesh. Um, and so, uh, also want us to see that Christ humbled himself. Paul says Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And so Christ was obedient to God's will, um, even to the point of a, a shameful and gruesome death on the cross. And, you know, I just, you know, brothers and sisters, I just want us to see that, um, if we want to understand humility, we, we look at Jesus, we look at, at what he did, what he accomplished for us on the cross. Um, he emptied himself, he took on flesh, lived a sinless life of obedience, um, and it ultimately led him to his crucifixion. Um, 
and he still faced the same temptation to sin that you and I face, yet he remained faithful. Uh, there was no selfish ambition to be found in him. He, um, he, he died for us, uh, and he had our interest in mind above his own uh, on the cross. And he counted sinners like you and I more significant than himself. And so we should do likewise in our own lives. And I want to close with this. Um, I've heard this illustration several times, and, and, I, and I think it's a good, uh, a good picture of our, our struggle with pride and selfishness. But it's a story of a famous conductor who was once asked, uh, he was being interviewed, and he was asked, what is the hardest instrument to play? And the uh, conductor didn't even hesitate. He replied, second violin. Um, so the, the guy who was interviewing was kind of puzzled at that. And he went on to explain uh, that he can always get plenty of people that want to play first violin, that want to be in the first seat. Um, but to find one who plays second violin, who plays in the second seat uh, with as much enthusiasm as the person in the first seat, uh, now that's a problem. And he goes on to say, but yet, if no one plays second, then we have no harmony. Um, you know, so I want us to see that um, to have unity, uh, to have to live in humility, we cannot be the most important person in our lives. We just can't. We have to stop. We have to lay aside our own interests to the interest of others, just like Christ did. Um, and... You know, we have to overcome this mindset that I am what's most important. Um, and that's hard. It's hard for me. Um, it's hard for us as humans to do that. It really is. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, church, today to, to strive to live a life uh, of humility so that we may be unified and then so that the gospel may be spread in our individual lives and as a church that we can can make an impact. Um, and then at the final two verses, verse nine and 10, it says that um, every knee will bow and uh, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And, you know, uh, I want us to, to see that um, as Paul closes this, this passage. And, you know, that is true. One day, every knee and tongue will well, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess uh, that Jesus is Lord. So I want us to see uh, in the end, as Paul closes this, he reminds us that Jesus is Lord. Um, and, you know, whether someone believes that or not in this lifetime, there will come a day where they will realize, understand, and confess that Jesus is Lord. Um, but praise God that he gives us that opportunity to believe in him and confess that uh, during this lifetime. And so uh, if you haven't done that today uh, or if you haven't done that in your life, uh, just know you have that opportunity today. I know I'm not with you um, physically, but, you know, if Jesus, uh, if you're not sure if, if you have a relationship with Jesus or he's not Lord of your life, um, it's really simple. Um, all you have to do is, is cry out to him uh, right now, wherever you are, and, you know, just uh, confess and acknowledge that before God that that you're a sinner and that you um, you're in need of redemption um, and just believe that Jesus is who he says he is believe that he's the son of God uh, that he he did live a sinless life um, that he died for my sins for your sins on the cross and he rose from the dead um, and, and just ask him in that prayer just ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life uh, and repent from your old way of living. And it's that simple. Um, you know, there's no formulated prayer or exact words uh, that have to be said. Uh, God just, Scripture just tells us to believe and repent. And so uh, I encourage you to do that today if you haven't. Um, and thank you. Uh, it, it was an honor to, to walk through this passage with you today. Um, be sure and connect with us. Uh, I believe there's a link uh, that we're going to have. Uh, or you can just go on our website and fill out a connect card if you have any questions about that. Um, or you just need to reach out. Um, uh, love you, church family. Um, God bless you during this time. And uh, thank you for, for being with us today.